Hello uh, and welcome to this webinar presented by the volunteers of the IET's Cambridge Network. We represent folks in the Cambridgeshire area but very pleased to welcome those from around the UK and indeed globally tonight. My name is Phil Zerngast, I'm the chair of the local network and I will be your host tonight. Now before we come to our speaker I'll just cover some housekeeping points. Uh, we will be taking questions tonight but we'll leave answers to the end of the event. And if you'd like to post a question, please use the Q&A button, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen if you wiggle your cursor. Please remember that's the Q&A button, not the chat button. Uh, we'll be recording the event tonight, uh, and that will be available in a few days' time on our YouTube channel, uh, which you can find by uh, searching for IET Cambridge. Now, uh, if you would like a CPD certificate, uh, you can do that by uh, emailing us on camsec at gmx.com. And I'll put that email address up uh, in the chat panel uh, during the event tonight. Um, and if you would like to uh, sign up for any of our future events, uh, you can do that. If you uh, look on uh, Meetup, uh, again, look for IET Cambridge, uh, or you can find us on the IET's new NGEX community um, website, again, if you look for IET Cambridge. Now, on to tonight's event, um, and I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker tonight, uh, Professor Fumia uh, Iida, uh, to talk about robotics, AI, and agriculture. Uh, Fumia is a Professor of Robotics in the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. He's also the Director of Bio-Inspired Robotics, um, and he's also Deputy Director of the EPSRC Centre of Doctoral Training in Agri-Food Robotics. Uh, so, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to our speaker, uh, Fumia. Okay, um, I hope you can hear me okay. Good, and I see my, I hope you can see the screen. So um, thank you very much, Philip. Uh, it's uh, very nice to uh, have this invitation to this IET event today uh, on the lecture of soft robotics and AI driving revolution in agriculture. So as uh, um, Phil kindly introduced, uh, I wear a couple of different hats over here. I'm a professor of robotics in Cambridge, but also uh, our research uh, is driving towards uh, three keywords here in the uh, title of the lecture, the soft robotics, AI, and agriculture. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited to have um, uh, these three topics in my uh, research group in Cambridge, because this is almost a miracle that, that we came together at the same time for big in impact. So I want to explain um, uh, each of this concept, each of this research field, uh, one by one, so that I can give you a bit of an out, um, outline of each of these uh, uh, technology areas, so that we can uh, uh, see how we can collaborate together in the future. So um, let me just start with a basic outline uh, of uh, what robotics is and where we stand at the moment. So this is the cover page of the uh, journal uh, Economist uh, about eight years ago now uh, that they have a special issue about the rise of the robots. And uh, this was really, really interesting uh, special issue that time because uh, this uh, captures a really important point um, um, of, of the robotics technologies, uh, state of the art, and this was actually predicting very well what happened in the last seven or eight years. So the reason why uh, rise of robots or revo uh, uh, robotic revolution, as other people call, uh, is happening is basically three reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, technologies became really, really cheaper in the last 10 to 15 years. The robot technology used to be uh, three times, five times, sometimes 10 times more expensive than the cost of the technology today. Uh, and uh, that opens the door for new application areas, obviously. And the second thing is that robotics became really easier uh, in the sense that we can buy technologies if you have money, uh, which was not the case 10, 20 years ago. We have to develop everything from scratch. And that was uh, what the big barrier for the development of uh, a robotic application. 
And the third point I want to uh, make here is the faster uh, technologies, the connect and share technology. This is probably one of the most important things out of three uh, is that the technology of robotics became really connected and shared. So you don't have to know uh, much of robotics technologies in details. Uh, but as soon as you know a little bit of uh, uh, ideas of what how engineering works and some engineering uh, knowledge, then you can actually download the software. You don't actually need to know how to program. You can download the software, run it in your computer. Uh, and uh, even for mechanical parts, mechanical designs, you don't have to design by yourself. You can download the uh, code, uh, uh, the design, and then you can do the 3D printing and so on um, at, at home. So actually, uh, these three elements in the technologies make, make the robotics um, landscape very, very different way in the last 10 or 15 years. So that's why I'm telling my uh, most of the students in Cambridge that you know if you're doing robotics, you know, you're doing the right thing because this is a very interesting point in the history of mankind that the robots can actually make an impact to our society. Uh, and if you're not doing robotics, you're not too late because the technologies are getting easier and faster and cheaper. So almost anyone can start robotics at any time uh, from now on. So that's why uh, it's a really, really exciting time uh, for roboticists to work on in, in, uh, uh, to, to, to solve the problems in our society. So the question now is where are the robots, right? We usually don't see robots in our household, uh, but our human society are no longer uh, sustainable without the robotics technologies. Uh, if you look at the uh, behind the scenes, uh, robots are actually everywhere. So look at the production lines of autonomous, uh, the production lines of cars and uh, other uh, machinery. Uh, robots are working all the time uh, in the factories without, without break 24 seven. Uh, and that makes uh, our um, uh, our industry more sustainable, uh, cheaper, and more efficient. If you look at the logistic chain uh, of uh, um, of uh, online uh, retailer, or also um, in hospital environments, robots are uh, everywhere, automating all the logistic needs uh, without human interventions. Uh, and then on the uh, top, uh, the bottom left corner, of course, we, you know, everyone knows that the, the autonomous driving is coming. Our cars are, are getting more and more uh, intelligent day by day, and we uh, actually see more uh, complete autonomous driving in the near future. So actually robotics is everywhere in our uh, society. Uh, and uh, this trend is no longer um, able to stop, right? We just need to keep going and how far we can go with robotic applications. Uh, and uh, the question then is how far are we going to go with the robotics technologies? Uh, here is the list of uh, robotic applications um, analyzed in the, uh, some of the road mapping documentation. So this one is from a uh, uh, European Union uh, consortium of robotics uh, uh, analyzing what are the robot market, where are the opportunities, uh, what are the problems solved, what are the problems not solved yet. Um, and uh, as you can see here in the list, there's lots of almost any industry is included as a, a potential market of robotics applications, uh, including industry manufacturing, cleaning, medical robotics, entertainment, logistics, autonomous cars, inspections, uh, construction, and agriculture, surveillance, uh, healthcare, elderly care, and personal service robots. So, so this is really, really exciting that the robots could almost go anywhere in our society and in our, our industry. Uh, but you know, one of the biggest questions for robotics engineers now is uh, what of, uh, which of these technologies, which of these markets are actually solved problem technologically and the one, one, uh, which one of them are not solved yet, right? So this is a real a big question for each engineer, especially for robotics engineer, I uh, work in the industry and in, in the, um, in, the uh, in, in the university. Uh, we need to have a very good assessment of what have been solved, what have not been solved, which are the easier ones, which are the difficult ones, and all of these things. So this is actually the, uh, our daily discussion in our laboratory um, okay, what are the problems we should be solving uh, based on our technologies today? So um, if there's no easy ans answer to this question, which ones are more difficult, which ones are more uh, easier. Uh, but uh, here is the, actually one of my uh, perspectives, like um, this is my views about the, what, which one is more difficult, which one is easier. Uh, and um, 
Um, so the industry and application at the top of this list are uh, uh, comparatively easier uh, than those those in the bottom of the of the list. So if you look at the industry manufacturing or cleaning, uh, we saw already in the videos that the robots are uh, everywhere in factories, uh, robots are everywhere um, in the uh, logistics chain. So these are the uh, problems that are rather uh, easy compared to the problems in healthcare, elderly care personal service robots and all these kind of things uh, that we cannot really well define. Uh, and uh, um, and you know, this discussion is especially important for younger students in the, um, and younger entrepreneurs that, you know, what are the problems solved already? Because uh, lots of money and efforts are wasted if you, you know, focus on the wrong market, wrong application based on the technologies. Uh, so that, this is a really important uh, uh, question. Of course, this is not single answer, right? It's just one perspective that I think uh, interesting, uh, but uh, you know, this is something we need to really think about. And the one point I want to uh, uh, um, uh, emphasize here is that agriculture is actually sitting in the middle of this. So uh, it's uh, something really easy. It's not completely easy, but at the same time, it's not completely difficult, uh, impossible. So the, uh, this is one of the reasons why I think agriculture should be addressed as a, a, a you know, next technological uh, challenge uh, for um, innovative researchers uh, like those in the universities. Um, Okay, so why um, there are easy problems and difficult problems in robotics, right? So that's the kind of things we need to really think about and analyze more carefully. So um, what I always uh, I use, uh, the, the slide I'm going to use uh, in this kind of discussion is, uh, is this one. So um, uh, what we see in the um, very well-developed industry of robotics, uh, which we call this Robotics 1.0 application. So these are the applications that we see uh, industry environment. We see in the factories and see uh, on, the, on the street um, that uh, uh, this, this kind of task are very well uh, predict. Uh, these tasks are based on the high predictable uh, problems and the high programmable problems in the sense that we know exactly how the environment looks like, um, you know, next moment, next day, next year. Uh, and the programmability means that we can actually modify the problems uh, if the robots are not able to solve, right? So in that case, we can actually apply very algorithmic, very systematic top-down design methods uh, of this. It's a very complex system uh, in a systematic manner. Uh, and that's why uh, we can see a lot of lots of impressive technologies available in the factories and, uh, and other industry environment. Uh, but having said that, uh, there are lots and lots of problems uh, in our daily life, uh, which we cannot solve, which our robots cannot solve problems. Uh, that's what we call robotics 2.0. In other words, this is the real world environment, real world tasks. So in this kind of task, uh, we usually have a low level of predictability and low level of programmability. You know, just by looking at uh, the cleaning task of a very com uh, messy student rooms or search and uh, rescue missions in the disaster site, all these tasks, uh, robots are still struggling to solve because the tasks are not very well defined. Um, the environment and tasks are not very well predict predictable. Uh, and uh, the robot has to be somehow creative, auto adaptive, and uh, we need a design for emergence uh, in the sense that uh, you know, the, the robots that we're building, uh, we actually don't know what kind of tasks these robots are solving, right? And the robot has to uh, come up with the solutions by itself um, after this, uh, the, um, all, all the systems are being built. So in this case, we just need to think of a different way of building robots, and therefore we think the paradigm shift is really, really necessary. Uh, one another point I want to make is the rigid interaction and soft interaction. So most of the robots in the industry environment are made out of rigid materials, usually metal, plastics, and uh, other hard materials. Uh, because anything soft, anything flexible are uh, really disturbing the predictability and probability uh, aspects of this kind of uh, robotics. And therefore, we, our robotics technologies are developed around the rigid uh, body assumptions. 
Whereas if we need the robots in the real world environment, we need more soft type uh, in a sense that they can negotiate with the environment. Soft materials can be used for many different kinds of tasks. And that's why this is really uh, interesting uh, research areas. Uh, and uh, robotics 1.0, robotics 2.0. I think we, we really need a paradigm shift uh, in the next generation. I don't know how long it's gonna take to achieve the truly uh, 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 different paradigm uh, robotics. Uh, but I think you know, this transition has to, uh, ha has to happen uh, in the coming uh, years and decades. And that's what we're trying to do. So now um, the, the problem of agriculture. So the agriculture is uh, uh, somewhere in between. We call this robotics 1.5 uh, rather than uh, 1.0, because in a sense, um, that the, the, the problems in many problems in agriculture is somewhere in between. So this is a video from one of our, our collaborators, uh, G's, uh, G's Growers uh, is one of the largest vegetable growers in the UK. Um, this company is uh, producing 2 million or 3 million liters every week. Uh, and there are hundreds of hundreds of harvesters um, are actually out in the field are working every day doing this kind of uh, 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 things, right? Uh, so this harvest, this company itself is actually technologically well advanced and lots of things are um, automated. They do a lot of investment uh, automating everything. Uh, but if you come down to the harvesting problems, uh, they cannot really solve, they could not find a good solution to solve this uh, harvesting problems. And that's why we started working together how we can solve this kind of problems uh, in, the, in the near future. So if you look at the, um, carefully what this harvester is doing, and one of the reasons why it's so difficult is that um, you know, every litter is different. Uh, and every actions that harvester is making is also different. So this is a, a trimming process of the lettuce. So when you harvest the lettuce, you really need to get rid of the unnecessary leaves uh, and you need to make it really uh, nice looking because this uh, product has to go to the supermarket straight after harvesting. So uh, making a really delicate interactions with an unstructured product uh, or less structured product is a really, really, really difficult for robots today. So that's why I thought this is a really interesting problem we can, we can deal with. Uh, but at the same time, this is not completely unstructured problem because we are always having similar kind of lettuce and the similar kind of conditions in the field. So this is a semi-structured environment but it's not completely structured. So that's why I thought this is a really interesting problem for robotics uh, uh, technologies. Uh, and this is just one example. We are doing a lot and lots of different aspects of agriculture. Uh, just to give you some example here, uh, there's so many um, seasonal workers currently in the UK solving uh, various problems, uh, such as quality control fruits. On the left hand side, um, the, uh, these men, these workers actually are sorting these oranges so that we can put it in a machine for the quality control. The middle picture, this lady is doing um, a technical work about the quality assessment before going to the supermarket. And these uh, uh, technicians have to uh, make juice of uh, apples, uh, or the oranges, pineapples, melons, and uh, all that kind of uh, foods 24-7, uh, nonstop. And uh, this is a really, really tedious, difficult task for humans because uh, it's not really a healthy environment um, in the sense that you do lots of rep repetitive tasks um, and that's a lot of workers actually leave after a couple of, uh, couple of years, even though we need a lot of training efforts to make uh, these technicians uh, workable in this, uh, in this industry. And then on the right hand side, this is also very interesting ones that, uh, uh, as you know, this uh, UK uh, British people love leek, uh, just like ourselves, like I, I myself, Japanese eat a lot of leeks at home, uh, but you know, leeks, are really, really uh, difficult crops to, um, to be uh, trimmed before, uh, before being sale, uh, sold in the supermarkets. And there, again, hundreds of hundreds of seasonal workers working uh, every day doing this kind of um, uh, manual uh, tasks uh, in, the, in actually uh, in, in, in Cambridgeshire. So that's something we really need to think about how we can address with our robotics technologies. So, um, so yeah, there's just summary of the challenges of robotic manipulation, uh, looking at all these industry uh, problems. 
uh, well, one of the biggest problem is actually cost, right? The human labors are very, very cheap compared to uh, lots of technologies that we use uh, in the manufacturing industry. So most of the seasonal workers working uh, for between eight and 10 pounds per hour. I think this is slightly higher right now, uh, but this is the order of the, um, the costs we need to solve, or order of the price of technology we need to solve. And then the dexterity. Uh, so all of the seasonal work has to do so many different kinds of things in very, very quick, short period of time. So, you know, chopping off the, um, of the uh, products and trimming the products, inspect and wrap and all that kind of things, uh, five seconds. And most of the seasonal workers not always doing the harvesting, depending on the season, they have to do all different kinds of things. Uh, and that dexterity is something really, really missing in our technology, robotics technologies. Uh, and then we have sensing perception uh, problems that the humans are very sensitive to small differences in the products uh, and the physical contact adaptability and the overall intelligence uh, a general uh, challenge that we need, need for this kind of industry. So this is generally speaking, we are, uh, we are uh, interested in. So coming back to this question of uh, robotics 1.0 and robotics 2.0, we can actually look at it from different angle. Uh, on, a, on one hand, robotics 1.0, our conventional robotics technologies are based on optimization for the single task. So most of our robots are made for given um, a task that is known before the design. Uh, so um, uh, therefore these robots are very rigid, no redundancy, uh, a lot of repetitive tasks. Um, and they, these robots are usually very efficient uh, and therefore these robots are very cheap. Uh, compared to that, Robotics 2.0 uh, is something we need more intelligent, uh, less optimized for single tasks, but uh, more optimized for many different kinds of tasks. Uh, and it, it should be doing not completely repetitive. Uh, and therefore we need some sort of redundancy, some sort of adaptability. Uh, and therefore, it's natural to bring this uh, natural that these kind of systems are very, very expensive in the end. Uh, um, and that's actually one of the biggest challenge for the robotics engineers uh, introducing technologies for the industry in agri-food uh, agri sector. So how can we do robotics 2.0 uh, in uh, a less expensive way? And that's the one, uh, that's the, the point where uh, the soft robotics technologies come into picture. So let's think about how we can do intelligent robots, robotics 2.0, uh, without uh, putting too much uh, technology cost in it. So one example of this kind is uh, was shown in this, um, in this example of universal gripper. So this is a really, really interesting innovative design of the robotic end effect or the robot can grip some many, uh, manipulate many different kind of objects uh, in a very robust manner. But at the same time, this is a very cheap solution because this, is, uh, this doesn't have a much uh, technological components like the sensors and motors. So this uh, robot uh, is actually made out of balloon, right? So the end effector of this robot uh, made out of balloon and the balloon is a soft components that can be uh, deformed when, the, uh, when it's inflated. But this balloon is not just a balloon, it's a special balloon uh, in the sense that the inside this balloon, we have a particles uh, um, and the, um, some granule, uh, uh, granule materials inside. So when you apply vacuum on this, um, this actually uh, uh, transit, uh, uh, it's changed its phase from a soft interaction to rigid interaction, such that it can grasp a different kind of object uh, physically in contact with. So this is what uh, we, we call this um, um, the soft robotics because it has a material properties that, uh, is, uh, that has a soft pro uh, mechanical uh, characteristics, but the softness plays a very, very important role uh, to achieve this uh, very flexible intelligent functions of grasping many different kinds of things uh, in, uh, in a very delicate fashion. So you know, just explain how this universal grid part works, right? So this uh, uh, universal grid part has a deformable surface when it's inflated. So this is a grid part that has a vacuum um, a pump connected. So when it's inflated, it can deform in the shape of the object in contact with. 
Uh, and as soon as you have a physical contact, you can achieve the vacuum so that we can actually give a pressure from the soft surface on the, on the uh, op op uh, object in contact with. So once you have a, um, a connections like this established, we can, uh, we can do a bit of engineering about how this gripping force works, right? So the gripping force consisting of two uh, elements. One of them is the friction force with the physical contact, and another one is suction force. Uh, that is in, uh, because of the uh, gap between object and gripper. So um, of course, you know, these forces are calculated very carefully about you know, measuring all the mechanical interactions between object and gripper. And we can do that analysis engineering of this uh, manipulation uh, uh, capabilities. But what's really important in the soft robot interactions is that uh, the softness is doing all of this functionality for free, right? The robots don't need to know all of these details of how uh, our forces are um, uh, generated. Uh, but what robots need to do is on, off of vacuum and everything else is kind of automatically sorted out because of the material level interactions between the gripper and, uh, and the object. So it actually, um, the material properties, in, in this case, the granular materials within the uh, balloon is playing a very important role. Uh, and that's the uh, kind of science bit of all these technologies that we can actually use the particle um, jamming uh, the, um, uh, uh, the particle uh, physics can be applied to this kind of interactions and that will solve a lot of problems in soft robotics. So yeah, this is a really, really interesting starting point that you know, soft materials can actually do a lot of interesting uh, soft interactions leading to intelligent functions. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the story is not that simple, right? So the, the, the challenge of soft robotics is actually not just making everything soft, but actually we need to do a hybrid structure of soft and rigid, um, uh, uh, rigid uh, con configurations. Um, the, the reason is the softness is good because we have a flexibility, uh, large degrees of freedom. We can do so many uh, different kinds of interactions with different kinds of objects. So that is the, the breakthrough of soft robots, how we can make industry type rigid robots to soft robots that allow us very um, uh, delicate interaction with many different kinds of objects. But on the other hand, the softness is uh, uh, bringing us a lot of troubles at the same time, in the sense that the soft structure cannot uh, transmit a large amount of force in the distant location. Uh, that means that we cannot apply a large force in soft structures, and that will uh, lead to the problem of a pre precise control or a fast control or powerful control of the uh, structure. So we are not really do big robots, fast robot, precise robots uh, by using soft technologies. So what we really need to think about for the new paradigm in soft robotics is how we can do the, uh, um, the hybrid uh, between uh, the rigid and soft so that we can actually do um, uh, intelligent interactions in, uh, um, in for general purpose systems. So, um, in, in fact, in our hands, it's, if you look our hands very carefully, uh, it's a really beautiful engineered, um, in, engineered system in the sense that uh, the softness and the rigid, rigidities come together in one piece, right? On one hand, we have a very rigid uh, bones and nails um, um, are put together uh, uh, with the soft uh, elements like uh, skins and muscles and tendons and, and, and ligament and so on. Uh, and that's a really uh, the, uh, the challenge from scientific point of view, how we can build such a uh, robotic system uh, in the near future. So we are doing a lot of, lots of uh, technological investigations, how we can make more like a bio-inspired, bio-plausible systems uh, in the artificial manner. So one of the projects we're doing is the uh, construction uh, process of uh, using multi-material 3D printers. So this is the uh, printers, uh, 3D printer that can use uh, both the very soft materials and at the same time uh, rigid materials, we can make a complex uh, um, the, the skeletal structure of our hands, uh, 3D printed uh, for 
um, uh, the software interactions. And this is a really, really breakthrough technology to make more complex, more uh, bio-inspired uh, uh, structure of, uh, of robots in the future. And we do a lot of uh, interesting projects, like uh, something you know we can do, but the conventional robots cannot do. So here is the kind of investigation how we can design such as a thumb joint of our hands, uh, because the softness uh, and the rigidity at the same time is uh, quite important when we're doing a, a piano playing uh, with this thumb abduction and so abduction abduction problem. So we can actually make a really heterogeneous distribution of the softness if we have uh, this kind of manufacturing technique uh, like a uh, multi-material 3D printers. And uh, obviously there are lots and lots of actuation challenges how we can actuate the soft structures um, and by using a uh, bolding cables and tandem, uh, the cable driven system for um, the, the soft rigid hybrid structures. Um, and that's one actuation is one of the challenges we can, uh, uh, we are investigating in, uh, um, with a lot of resources. Uh, but at the same time, the next challenge is also the sensing part, right? How we can make material level sensing uh, and uh, so this is the investigation we are doing with uh, um, the, the self-healing conductive elastomer. So this is the, uh, um, a polymer that can be deformed in a very flexible way, but we also want to functionalize in, uh, them in many ways. On the one hand, we want to make it electrically functionalized such that we can use it as a deformation sensor, but at the same time, we can do the self-healing uh, properties so that we can cut off, but we can also bring it back. Uh, and uh, this self-healing part can be used for 3D printing uh, process, right? So if you if the material is the thermoplastic uh, properties, then we can do 3D printing, but also the uh, room temperature self-healing is interesting because even if you have a material that's broken, uh, uh, it can automatically heal uh, after after some time. So this is a kind of, you know, the basic research we're doing in our laboratory because the material level intelligence is the kind of uh, the next uh, big step for soft robotic uh, revolution. So how we can achieve robot intelligence in material level, it's what we are um, we, we're facing uh, at the moment in the uh, basic science. So on the one hand, we want to have a soft deformation. So soft material softness is very important. But also we want to make it functionalize in terms of actuation, sensing. Uh, we also want to do the computation based on the, on, on the soft level, like our brains that can uh, deform, but it can also do a lot of computation. Uh, and then we can also build up uh, the soft batteries and so on. So, so if we have a, this basic material level intelligence, we can actually uh, open the door for many, many interesting applications, uh, not only grasping, uh, but also wearable or, uh, um, or surgical robots and other kind of locomotion robots and so on. So this is the kind of uh, technological baseline uh, for the innovations to make in the near future. Okay, so the last uh, uh, 15 minutes of my uh, presentation is really uh, about how we can bring all the soft robotics technologies uh, um, um, to the real world uh, practical problems. Uh, because, you know, we are building technologies uh, or investigating technologies for the uh, sake of our interest, basically. Uh, but they, and, and then at the end of the day, we need to bring all these technological innovations to the practical use in our society. And uh, this is a really, really difficult challenge for all of the roboticists because um, you know, the real world problems are not, um, uh, not always uh, straightforward. So what we really need to think about is uh, uh, technology is a small bit of the whole thing, but we actually need a good team of collaboration in the, in, uh, in the interdisciplinary background. Uh, and also the cross-sectorial uh, collaboration is very important. But most importantly, uh, finding the right problems to solve is the real, real challenge for our, uh, our robotics engineers. So that's something I want to discuss with you uh, at the end of my presentation today. So what does it mean finding a good problem, right? So uh, when we started agriculture project, uh, I myself uh, knew nothing about agriculture until uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, when we started uh, this project in, in Cambridge, 
Um, we have a very good collaborators in the ELE where uh, the, the GIS Grower uh, exists. Uh, and, uh, and the GIS Grower was the really, really great partners because they helped us really understanding what the problems, uh, what kind of problems they have and what kind of problem we can uh, uh, use our technology. So we went to this field uh, with the team of my uh, uh, the research, uh, with my research team, and then see how we can apply all these technologies in, in, in reality. So this is not easy because, you know, the real world is, is much more complex than what we usually imagine. Uh, and a lot of things that are not related to basic research have to be somehow addressed uh, by collaborations. Uh, one of the real, real challenges is that uh, the task and environment is always, always much, much more complex than we, we think. Environment is usually changing all the time. And the research team, we not always have the uh, uh, ideal um, the skill set within my group. Uh, and then target technology is, of course, important bit, but it's a small part of the whole thing. And uh, it's a small robot put on the uh, tractor. What is more important is that how we can have a tractor in the field uh, and then how we can do an um, access to the uh, field and so on. So finding a good problem is really, really difficult. So I would like to really have a, a discussion on this matter. And if you have problems in your profession, I would really like to talk with you because I think finding problems is a real uh, important uh, challenge. So in our project, uh, one of the, the first problems we solve uh, is actually the computer vision problem. So, uh, so how we can deal with the recognition or sensing problems in unstructured environment. So this is the, the uh, scene uh, uh, we usually see in the field of the lettuce. Uh, and uh, you know, even for humans, it's not easy to find where are the lettuces. And if you find you know where the lettuce is, we don't know which one of them are ready to harvest. And all of these things are actually done by human harvesters in a fraction of a second. Um, and that's, that's the kind of problem we solved in, uh, at the beginning. So if you look at carefully, uh, there are lot, lots of weed and unnecessary information in this scene. So that's something we cannot always easily get rid of from the, um, from the system. But also we need to really do the quick assessment of, uh, uh, and, um, of the products that like are good to harvest our lettuce and not always there. We have lots of infected lettuce or immature lettuce of, uh, already there. And all of these things have to be somehow recognized in, uh, in a very quick manner. So luckily uh, we are very um, in the interesting time in the history of technologies that the machine learning is making a huge impact in our society. So uh, we have made use of our current situation that uh, um, the, the data-driven solution can actually solve it. So this is the machine learning, um, um, uh, the, the schematics of the machine learning technologies in, the, in a very high level abstract. There's nothing really complicated. We, have a, we need a lot of input raw data. Uh, what we want to do is sorting of this input data for different uh, kind of uh, objectives. Uh, what we need is algorithm and uh, uh, supervisors, but as soon as we have algorithm uh, processors, uh, um, our algorithm and the processors uh, uh, processing is already there. We can actually download most of the machine learning um, uh, components and then we can just use it for our purposes, right? So, uh, but the real challenge is how we can prepare for this raw data and uh, how we can make a, a data labeled by human uh, supervisors. So this is a kind of a bottleneck what we have at the moment. So machine learning or, or, or uh, more uh, uh, um, uh, also known as the computational neural net, uh, convolutional neural network, CNN is the a very, um, the, uh, the groundbreaking technology for especially for computer vision problem that uh, almost any image can be input to the system and they can actually find out the solution to it as long as we have a lot of data. The reason we need a lot of data for this process is that there's so many variables in the convolutional neural network and all of these parameters have to be uh, uh, automatically determined. Uh, and for that reason, we need a lot of data. But on the other hand, 
uh, if we have a data, uh, we can solve pr pretty much any uh, computer vision uh, classification problem. So that's why we started to focusing on this problem. Uh, and we started this project with one of our undergrad students, Julia Kai. She's, uh, you know, one of the uh, Cambridge genius students that they can do something complicated very, very quickly. So what we did is basically we went to the field together, uh, half a day taking uh, thousands of pictures on the field, different uh, type of letters with different uh, part of the um, uh, field. Uh, and then uh, we actually uh, use this data uh, for the existing um, the, the off the shelf uh, algorithm, like a YOLO algorithm or darknet algorithm and so on. So these are um, uh, technical jargon you don't need to know, but the, basically you can download all this code. And what we need to do is basically uh, uh, have a data to fill into this uh, system. So what we did is basically uh, taking the data and then we need to do a bit of labeling of this data. Like we need a lot and lots of a human uh, labor force to make uh, this uh, the um, the ground truth data. But as soon as we have this data, we can actually use it for localization and classification problems. So we know where the, the computer can automatically detect where are the lettuces. Uh, and at the same time, what are the quality of lettuces, right? So whether it's good to harvest or immature it's, uh, or infected, and all this um, our classification task can be automatically done very easily. The important thing is that this, we use the off-shelf components, right? So um, the Julia can learn all this technology in a matter of a few weeks, uh, and we went to the field, get the data for one day or two days, uh, and then we can complete this kind of classification problems. It's just a matter of uh, three to six months. And uh, we even make a publication in the three month, uh, six month period. And this actually illustrates how fast we can do the development of this point. So um, what we did is basically collect a lot and lots of different kinds of data for localization tasks. So uh, we uh, uh, took 1,500 images. Uh, and all of them are manually um, are labeled, like where are the lettuces? And then uh, this, uh, um, the ground truth data um, can fed into this uh, uh, YOLO algorithm and that can automatically learn how to uh, output the data about where are the lettuces. And then we have uh, also the classification data set. So based on the uh, ground truth data, we can also classify into four different types, the harvest ready, immature, infected, or some other noises. And then uh, and other ready-made uh, machine learning algorithm can actually give us the uh, output for this. So this is really, really interesting because we can do this kind of computer recognition task, which used to be really, really difficult, right? This problem alone uh, is probably, you know, three to five year PhD project if, it's a, it, if, if it were the 10 years ago. Uh, but now you can, this is the problem for undergrad students to be solved in, in a couple of months. Um, and another bit of challenge is how to do the harvesting. So this was a little more complicated because uh, I would need a physical uh, interaction with the, uh, with the uh, product. So in this case, we have a PhD students working on a design of the harvesting devices. So this is the end effector that uh, is dealing with this complex structure of letters. So the real challenge here is that uh, um, the cutting window of the stem of the lettuce is very, very small. It's about one centimeter uh, harvesting uh, cutting window and how we can place the knife in that uh, location was a bit of a challenge. Uh, we need to do a lot of uh, design iterations of this uh, end effector of the, um, uh, for the harvesting rig. But after all, uh, we actually managed to develop this kind of system that we can make a really nice um, uh, uh, setup that will automatically detect the lettuce and we can pick it up and then bring it to the uh, different locations and release it in a very secure fashion. So uh, after all, uh, we managed to do uh, about 70 uh, successful harvesting of this lettuce and uh, um, uh, about a 90% success rate. The only problem at the moment is, is uh, this little too slow, 30 seconds per cycle. Uh, human usually do between five and 10 seconds. So uh, we need to speed up these things, and which is something we are working at the moment. Uh, but that's, uh, that's one of the um, um, kind of case studies we can do uh, for this kind of agriculture project. So there are many, many other interesting problems we can solve in a similar way. 
uh, that we have been working on. So uh, there are a couple of examples that we're solving is that, for example, how to do the, um, uh, the quality assessment of hard shell uh, fruits. Uh, so in this case, the mango uh, is usually um, um, tested in destruction way. So the destructive testing is usual for the um, maturity assessment of mangoes and kiwi, uh, the mangoes and the and avocado and so on. So we have used all this, uh, um, this soft, uh, soft sensing technologies to address how we can uh, solve this kind of uh, quality assessment without destroying um, destroying the um, uh, 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 fruit. And uh, also we started doing some more complicated uh, manipulation tasks, like a cooking process is generally the problem of food handling. So we built the robots that can do the omelets building, uh, omelets cooking, but at the same time, uh, how robots can understand the taste of the uh, cooked omelets in, by using machine learning is another really interesting challenge we have been uh, investigating in the past. Uh, and uh, the control of a uh, complex cooking task is a real challenge. So um, we have uh, um, uh, used uh, this machine learning technique, how we can actually automate the cooking process uh, of hundreds of different kinds of omelets automatically. Uh, and then uh, we actually did the human tasting problem uh, with this uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, this, this project. So how robot can understand the cooking process and the correlation to the human uh, evaluation of taste is another interesting challenge. But of course, um, you know, the cooking process itself is a real challenge how robots can learn it. So we again use the computer vision technique, like there are also ready-made algorithms available about the human gesture recognition in a robust manner. So this is something we can actually do quite uh, easily uh, today. So this is undergrad students again, um, using this off-the-shelf computer vision algorithm to automatically program a robot cooking process um, and uh, by, by demonstration. So that's another example how we can do the quick uh, development uh, of, uh, of, um, of the complex robotic systems. Okay, so I think, uh, I hope you have a kind of a bit of idea where we are coming from, where we're going. And I just want to give you a bit of summary of what we are doing at the moment. So I think the robotic revolution is really, really exciting uh, today. And we are standing in a very interesting point in the history of mankind. So that's something we uh, just want to let you know that uh, that's what we're doing. So the soft robotics is one of the a really exciting and paradigm shift we're making. And uh, there are many, many uh, interesting uh, opportunities how we can do cheap, but also intelligent uh, uh, technologies uh, um, deployed in the practical path. We're still uh, working hard on what the practical applications. So, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, uh, industry problems that we can solve by using conventional technologies, but also, we need to really make uh, inroads into more challenging problems uh, with, with the new technologies of, uh, of robotics. And uh, I just want to um, advertise a bit about our Center for Doctoral Training in Agri-Food Robotics. So this is a um, collaboration effort with the University of Cambridge, University of Lincoln, and the University of East Anglia, um, trying to train 50 PhD students uh, for the sector of agri-food uh, robotics. Uh, as you see, there are lots and lots of challenges in agri agri-food industry, and uh, we have definitely uh, not enough researchers and not enough technology developer in this field. So we're trying to do um, really um, uh, education and training of uh, uh, engineers for uh, this problem, significant problem in the agri-food industry. Uh, and uh, if you are, any of you are interested in helping us in any way, uh, the main point of this uh, the center is uh, putting a, uh, a network and com community uh, from the academics to the industry and the st uh, student partners all together so that we can make an impact in this area of agri-food robotics. So if you're interested from industry point of view or if you're interested as a student, uh, please let me know uh, or just come to our website so that uh, there are lots and lots of uh, uh, opening uh, studentships uh, that you can um, um, you can apply for. 
And obviously, we have a lot of collaborators in our project and, uh, and uh, in the uh, students and academics in Cambridge, but also lots of sponsors helping us making uh, this project all possible. And I'd like to start my presentation with the last slide, but if you're interested in more details of uh, technologies or interested in videos, pictures, please visit our website or just send me email, then you can find all the details in our uh, website. Okay, uh, and, uh, and with this, I'd like to stop my presentation and uh, I'd like to have a discussion with our uh, audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fumia. That was a fascinating overview of the technology um, uh, and the, some practical examples of the, uh, the good problems that you've, you've been working on. Um, and, and certainly the, the pitch for the um, AgriForward organization is, is fine. Um, there's obviously lots for uh, students and researchers listening tonight um, to, to think about. So um, I will hand over to uh, David um, to lead us through the Q&A session. David. Well, thank you very much, Phil. And thank you, uh, Fumia. Um, I found it interesting. Because I know that many other people around here. In fact, my first comment that's come through is um, great project and uh, his 12 year old son actually loved your presentation. So you've got some fans already. Um, the first question I had actually was from Sweden. Um, how, how do you see the value of design, human interaction, and user experience in enabling the faster transformation to robotic 2.0? Is it even effective? Okay, so that's a, a very good point. Um, and I'm not completely sure uh, in what way uh, this um, uh, person is asking these questions. Um, well, you know, I, I think uh, uh, there are lots and lots of problems we can solve with Robotics 1.0, and which is fine. And, and I'm not saying that which one is better or worse, right? I think Robotics 1.0 is absolutely great and they uh, deliver a lot of values to our society. The, que the, the, the question is what problems we cannot solve uh, with conventional technologies. And that's the, um, uh, the challenge that we are uh, interested in, especially as a robotics uh, engineers in academia and the, in the research sectors. We need to address the problems in the next uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 year timescale rather than next you know, two, three, five time year, uh, time scales. So if you look at the you know, next 10, 20, 30 year time scale, I, I think uh, the, the real challenge uh, is how we can actually make our machines and uh, uh, robots um, um, more to the human-like performances. Uh, and that's a real grand challenge for all the engineers uh, that um, you know, our robots are nowhere close to um, the human capability, the dexterity of manipulation or dexterity of locomotion, all of these things. Uh, and uh, we just need to find out how we, we go there in the long term. Uh, and on the way, of course, with this kind of problem cannot be solved in one day after another. Uh, in that case, we need to make use of all different you know, levels of uh, um, technologies, including material level intelligence, including human in the, in the loops system, uh, including you know, um, augmented reality, uh, mixed reality. All of these things will contribute to our, our understanding of uh, our uh, bio-inspired robots closer to human performance. And that's, uh, I think, the answer to your question. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, yes. All right, thank you. Um, I have actually rather the question, a comment. If you want a soft biological model, cephalopods are probably better than vertebrates. Optimus squid arms have distributed intelligence, no rigid structure, but are good for gripping and manipulation. I don't know if you had any views on that particular feedback. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, that makes sense that they're thinking about really, really soft uh, animals and soft structures. Uh, but as I said in, in my, my presentation, uh, one of the real bottleneck of the soft robot, soft structure, is that we are not able to trans transmit the force uh, through the structure. So as soon as you have soft structure, you cannot really make a strong robot fast robots or precise robots, right? So that's a drawback of soft robotics. And uh, we really have to make a balance between 
the good point of soft robots and good point of the rigid robots and put them together so that we can solve many different kinds of problems. So that's what we learned from the, uh, from the first principle of soft robotics, so to speak. Uh, and that's something we, we need to think about. Okay, thank you. Um, how close are your projects in the lab to being commercialized? There's several people asking a very similar question. So it's obviously of much interest to people. Yes, so the commercialization is a very, very challenging problem. Um, usually this hardware type uh, is uh, taking something between five and 15 year uh, research and development until you actually see it in the, uh, in the business operations. Uh, in fact, our uh, latest harvesting robots, we started 2015 and now uh, it's 2020. So we're working on the six, seven years. Um, the, the reason um, it's, it's, uh, it's very slow is that on the one hand, this is a very expensive development process. We, we need millions and millions of pounds to make this kind of development happen. Uh, and if we, if we have, you know, Bill Gates helping me with, uh, I don't know, like a tens of millions, uh, we can probably solve it uh, within half a year, one year. Uh, but this is actually not the case, right? We also have to do the fundraising. We have to do the, you know, actual testing in the field. Uh, and that's a really, really time consuming process, especially you're working on uh, some new technology, like hardware technologies. Uh, but if we working on something, you know, closer to the industry, something like a computer vision problem, right? If you want to solve a computer vision problem, that's much, much easier. You can probably solve it in a um, you know, the month scale, month scale, year, year scale rather than decade scale. Um, so that's, um, that's the kind of thing. So we, uh, we, we th that's our views on the uh, tech transfer for, for the industry sector. Okay. Um, you mentioned the let lettuce robots performance metrics, e.g. percentage damaged. Can you compare that to the metrics for human workers and uh, what next for the project? How are you going to be considering the metrics for human workers and the comparison with the robots? Yes, uh, thank you. I think this is a very important question. And uh, you know, from end users' point of view, that's the only thing they care. So what they want is success rate, damage rate, and the speed and cost. And these are the four metrics that we really need to think about in the end, or at least for, 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 for important metrics. Um, and uh, the, the damage rate, so the humans uh, have uh, probably 90 to 95, or maybe even, you know, some experts can do 100% success, right? Uh, and compared to that, I think our robots, like 90%, uh, is actually quite good compared to the beginners of harvesters, right? And humans also struggle at the beginning how not to damage the, the litters at the beginning. So that's not too bad, but I think uh, one of the challenges is actually the speed. Uh, how we can actually achieve the human level speed. The human can do uh, five to 10 seconds per lettuce harvesting. Our robots uh, at the moment need something like a 20, 30 seconds uh, per lettuce. This is not uh, really, um, and at the same time, the cost is really, really uh, the uh, limiting factor. Our robots are just way too expensive compared to human labors. Uh, and that's the point we are striving to optimize at the moment. But I don't think this is a really uh, impossible problem to solve. I think we, this is just a matter of time how we can solve it. Okay. You're categorizing the images of lettuces to help train the decision system, reminding me of mechanical Turk concept, i.e. humans do the things humans are good at and robots do the things robots are good at. The problem which being the interface between the two can robotics to bridge that gap? Um, that's a very good point. So if we want to optimize our system for a specific given task, you know, then that's quite, um, uh, it, it's doable, right? It's feasible. And that's exactly what we are doing. Uh, and we are in fact, you know, categorizing four different types of lettuces. Uh, but you know, what humans can do, it's something more subtle. Right? It's not just four rigidly defined categories, but they can actually do something between, even if it's not completely perfect, they can recognize, oh, this lettuce can be perfect if you trim this you know, leaves and that leaves. So that kind of you know, subtlety of the recognition task is a quite interesting 
um, problem from a robot intelligence point of view, right? So what we are doing is very, very rigid, you know, mechanized uh, recognition task uh, based on the off-the-shelf uh, recognition uh, algorithms. But you know, obviously, uh, we can do a lot, a lot of interesting, um, challenging problems like a human uh, recognition uh, from that point of view. Okay, a bit of light relief for you. Professor, which of below do you think will come earliest? Human dating robot or a human dating virtual human? I think this is somebody who is looking for a, a lady or a gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, um, so yeah, well, how can we answer to this question? Um, yeah, well, you know, um, it's quite easy to actually um, let human anthropomorphizing things in front of you. Um, so, you know, if you have some random object, people can, you know, always uh, sympathetic, uh, um, uh, can, can really uh, have emotions about whatever object in front of you. So. Um, you know, this is more like a how to fake the human perceptions. Uh, whereas if you do something really um, uh, working together, a physical, um, um, you know, cooperation, collaborations, or even dating, then, then you know, that's going to be a real challenge, I think. <laughs> I think so. I think you've answered that very well. Quite a few people have asked questions uh, about using drones and uh, unmanned aerial vehicles as to whether these have a role rather than uh, you know a fixed piece of structure on the ground cutting lettuces, whether you could have a swarm of uh, drones to actually go and do some of the work. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think uh, drones are obviously uh, the, the groundbreaking, game-changing technologies uh, for many different industry. And agriculture is one of them. Obviously, there are many, many agriculture companies already using them uh, for different purposes, like monitoring and uh, data collection, and even for harvesting. Some companies start doing uh, using uh, uh, drones for harvesting. Um, and, uh, and absolutely, I think this is one of the promising technology that we should really uh, uh, looking at in the in the shorter time uh, scale. Uh, uh, my perception of drone is more like robotics 1.0 technologies, right? So uh, drones are really really great because they don't have to uh, physically interact with the environment in a, um, in a complex manner. So a drone can just you know, fly over to the target location without negotiating with the environment and so on. So, um, so, so from that point of view, robot, robotics one point, uh, drone as a robotics 1.0 is a promising solution in short time uh, perspective. And I, I, I fully uh, agree with you. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and, and the, the real question is, you know, how we can solve the problems that drone cannot do. So the problem with drones are that they are not very energetically efficient. Uh, they cannot carry heavy things and they cannot really do interactions with uh, a delicate environment uh, and all these challenges have to be addressed in a different manner so that's something uh, we are do, uh, dealing with okay does that ai development include designing futuristic methods like say people grouping together to discuss ways of recreating the human brain um e Yes, absolutely. I think uh, that's, I, I'm just trying to interpret this question, but uh, um, I, I suppose, um, you know, our ultimate goal is really trying to make our robotic system more creative, more adaptive, uh, and uh, more, um, you know, creative dealing with complex challenges that we actually don't know how to solve it. Uh, and that includes, you know, how robot can build robots in the future, right? So, um, you know, at the moment, all the designers, engineers struggling to design robots, uh, software, hardware, or implementation integrations. Uh, but all of these things, ideally, we want to um, uh, streamline by using new technologies, and especially AI, uh, machine learning, um, um, and uh, um, all these uh, associated technologies are a future candidate. So if you look at, you know, long-term, next 20, 30, 40 years, I think this is the direction we're going in any case. Okay. And somebody's asking if you actually have the ability to share your images 
you use for training in the AI model, as collaboration of images would help to accelerate any solution that may be developed. Absolutely. So, um, you know, there are uh, uh, increasing interest of open science. So uh, lots of people trying to share the data. Uh, and uh, that is one of the reasons why we can do very rapid development of technologies. So um, in, in our research level, we're trying to share as much, as, uh, as much data as possible for the, uh, for the other researchers, other developers to take advantage of. Uh, but on the other hand, in agriculture, uh, business is a bit sensitive uh, from, uh, um, from security and for other um, uh, business reasons. Uh, and uh, that's not always easy uh, to open source all, all the algorithm, all the data to everyone. So, but I think that's going to be um, uh, something we need to change in the near future, how we can do the collaboratively building um, uh, uh, solutions. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the um, autonomous driving industry, uh, they started sharing a lot of data together because I think, you know, that's more benefits than harm uh, for, the, uh, for the industry. So I think similar things will happen in the future for agriculture and food industry. Okay. And because to, to, we had quite a lot of questions, perhaps we'll end with this one. How many other research groups are working on soft robotics? And when did this work actually begin? Oh, um, okay. So that's a very good question. Um, if you're interested in soft robotics, I should have uh, advertised it, but the softrobotics.org uh, is the soft robotics researchers community um, that we have been uh, working on. So uh, we have about thousand membership in the soft robotics um, researcher com uh, community. And we have all sort of different um, uh, resources available. So please feel free to join softrobotics.org. Uh, then uh, you, uh, you, you know the answer to your question. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, the, uh, the research uh, has started about 10 years ago. Um, and uh, we made so much impact in the last 10 years in this area. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, indeed, for me. I'll hand you back to Phil, who will uh, close us all down. Thank you very much, indeed. Yes, um, thank you, David, and thank you, Famia. Um, that was, as I said, a, a fascinating insight that you've given us, and, and thank you um, so much for, for making the time to, uh, to talk to us tonight. Um, I think uh, we'd all wish you good luck in um, finding and solving some of those good problems that, uh, that you're out there searching for. Um, and uh, again, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I, I'm, I'm really open to uh, any collaboration. So please do contact me uh, or apply to our positions and uh, um, come to our website. Uh, we're really, really looking for a good problem to solve, to really, you know, the, the solve the, the problems we, uh, we face today in the human society. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, um, and I'll say thank you to everyone else that's uh, joined us tonight. Um, I hope you all found it as interesting as I did. Um, if you uh, want to see any of our future events, uh, please uh, look at the uh, Meetup um, page if you search for IET Cambridge, or look on the IET's NGEX website for the IET Cambridge network. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And that brings us to a close. And you can now disconnect from this webinar. Thank you. <laughs>